Welcome to the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners issues and updates on this day. Gary, um, you have a little announcement you want to make about our technology? Yes, the, the Zoom function is not operating this morning. Therefore, those of the public who are trying to watch this live, this will be posted on the county uh, internet site and the county YouTube page. So it's streaming live, but it is not on Zoom. We don't take public comment anyway for this portion, but it is not on Zoom. We will correct this uh, by tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Who's up first? All right, Chair, I'm going to shift the agenda slightly to accommodate our guest. The first item is the C-800 Public Safety Radio System Replacement Project Update. John Hartsock, Hartsock is the manager of the C-800 Radio System, and he has a quick update for you and a potential action by the board upcoming. Uh, John, welcome, and if you please give a quick update to the board, and then... We'll have a discussion. Sure. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Thank you. Uh, the system, uh, which we have been working on for about six years now, uh, that the uh, county passed a bond in 2016 of 59 million to to build the system. Uh, we were been delayed substantially in land use and other issues in getting construction started. So we started construction about three years late. The system is on the air and operating. I will say that's the one piece of good news. Uh, it's performing as we anticipated. The coverage has improved uh, dramatically. We are dealing with some issues with the users of uh, just transitioning from an analog to a digital system. Uh, probably of, of all the issues, we had some, as I said, delays in permitting which we had anticipated some of that. We had a healthy contingency for that. We had some delays or some issues with some equipment changes and ads just because of the time. But probably our worst area was in the construction area. Uh, uh, some overruns, uh, the, uh, one, of, one of them was the fact that we found that uh, six of our existing towers had seismic issues and uh, uh, needed to be changed out to meet the current seismic code uh, because one of the big issues in this whole system is resiliency, that it will withstand a nine earthquake and it will be there when we need it for the emergencies. Um, the area where we probably had the um, single biggest overrun was dealing with uh, three sites that we have built out Highway 224 from Estacada going uh, uh, south. And the purpose was to cover uh, the National Forest area primarily uh, for the Sheriff's Department's activities out there. It's a little bit different on the Washington County side of the system. Um, the Forest Service is all, pri the forest land on the west side of Washington County is primarily uh, privately owned, so they, the Sheriff's Department doesn't do as much work out there, whereas here in Clackamas County, as you know, the Sheriff's Department uh, has a contract with the Forest Service to provide law enforcement. So the expansion of the system in that area was critical to make sure that the Sheriff's Department had coverage. The three sites were remote. It took us almost three years working with the Forest Service to get those sites approved, even though they suggested them to us. Uh, but then construction, uh, cutting roads into them was far more difficult, and we had about 28 miles of power to install to get to the sites. We originally anticipated that would be done by a plowing method, which is relatively cost-effective, and as we got into it, it was more and more rock that over three quarters of it we had to bore with a boring machine, and that's where our cost really ran high. Further complicated by the fires, uh, the ice storm, and then the clearing of highway, working with ODOT on the clearing of Highway 224. Uh, so that's been our struggle. Um, all in all, where we are, we are, uh, have an overrun of about two point, a little over $2.5 million um, that we're looking for possibly some help from the county in that situation uh, to rectify that. And that, so that's a, a short synopsis. If, if there are questions, I'd be certainly pleased to answer them. John, is this, um, I was here 
I was yes. a commissioner last time. Yes, you were, ma'am. And refresh my memory, this uh, was a referral to the voters, yes. correct? And how much per thousand, now are all county residents paying on it that have property? That's correct. How it, much cents per thousand is this? Fifteen cents. Fifteen cents. And you collected $69 million. did I hear you say 59 that? Fifty-nine million. Sixty-nine? Fifty-nine million was the bond issue. There were premium dollars with the bond that I'm... Uh, I'm assuming you are aware of that when the bonds are sold, you do have the opportunity to have premium dollars. Uh, and there was uh, uh, seven million in premium dollars that was collected. What does that mean? It's, I always, when they sell the bonds, the purchasers of the bonds uh, offer uh, a premium uh, you still have to pay for the bond dollars, but they, they provide, it's like a discounted rate for additional dollars. Uh, and I'm not explaining that well. Uh, I, can, I can get, I'll send you an explanation. So I apologize for it that. It was $59 million bond issued for how many years? Uh, 15 years. And when is the due date? That would have is, uh, 31, I believe it is. 19, uh, 20, 23, okay. Um, when you in, started these uh, construction projects, did you set aside a, a contingency? Yes, ma'am. We, we had uh, about $7 million outlined for contingency, mm -hmm. which would have covered the areas and problems we had in, in the bulk of the project, where, as I say, we ran in to the large overrun was in the construction area. So the, the bond is paid in 2031. Is that when the taxing stops as well? That would be correct. Okay. Um, I see there's a couple. Oh, Gary, your hand is up. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, I'm jumping ahead, but things for you to consider today is if you choose to offer support to the C-800, we are not, we cannot use ARPA dollars. We've already searched that, so that is not an option. We could give a loan that could be repaid. You could give an outright gift of the general fund. You could send this back to the voters, or you could say no. Those are the options staff has come up with for you to Good. consider. I think we can all talk about those. Commissioner Savas, you're up. Yeah. Well, thanks, Gary, for that overview, and thanks, John, for coming before us today. Um, it would seem that um, I don't know if at the time, had we known about it, um, you know, there was FEMA eligibility as a result of the forest fires, but I'm in, I'd be inclined, uh, again, hearing what um, Administrator Schmidt just said, I'd be inclined to pursue a couple of their avenues, one at the state level because of the forest fires and the other one at the federal level because of the forest fires and use, and because it is what it is, right? I mean, it was uh, a, a result of that extra cost and expense from the fires. Um, we're certainly seeing a substantial amount of uh, overruns and I'm just afraid, frankly, we've got to we got we got to have a challenge. And I'll put this aside for a moment. We we can't really complete everything we got before us right now because we're just a lack of resources, and our eligibility is limited in those areas. So, I just don't know, Gary. Is there um, or John? Is there any avenue um, which we could contact our federal delegation or whatnot with some of this infrastructure dollars coming through? I think public safety is something that resonates with a lot of people. I think this would falls right in line with that. I would be supportive of any effort in that in that regard. We definitely can check on that. Um, what's what's your time What's your timeline, John? That you need to either pause for construction or to move forward. Um, we probably have about four months. Okay. Uh, the you know, if I may throw a suggestion, maybe I, I know there are dollars coming from uh, uh, earmarks. Uh, which they just did a round of those, <clears throat> and there'll be another round, but that's that's probably a year and a half off, if I'm not mistaken. Elizabeth may know better than I. Um, it, so that could be a possibility. May we do an interim type of, of loan uh, type of thing. It would be something to think about. <clears throat> what did, happens in four months? You said you had four months. What, what happens oh, in four months? We have, we have cash flow to get us through actually the finishing of the Tom, Dick, and Harry site, which are, is our last site of, of finishing. At that point, then, we're going to have some uh, large payments uh, uh, 
uh, to, to other vendors that haven't completed their work yet, and those will start to come due in about four months. So we have cash flow for about four months. So you at four months, you would still have payment due to vendors that you hired to do work. That's correct. That you will not have. Okay, we have a couple of commissioners. Commissioner Fisher. So we have this on our issues. There isn't a memo. There isn't any information you talked about. There's a $2.5 million shortfall related to the wildfires and challenges with construction. I mean, I have a lot of questions. My questions are, why is this just coming to us now? That's my first question. My next question is, why isn't there a memo outlining the issue, what the possible options are, what the pros and cons are of each option? I mean, this is disturbing. We are a governing body that is looking at a $2.5 million shortfall of which this is brand new to me, mm -hmm. without any documentation. Mm -hmm. This is not good governance, and I'm very concerned about it. I don't think we should make any decisions today. I think we need to be prepared with all of the information and analysis from our staff as to what the options are. So when you say you have, because my mind, you have a 7.9 million contingency, and that doesn't cover a $2.5 million shortfall. I don't understand how that's possible. So I have way more questions than I do answers, and I do not think that a five-minute issue session is the place to address this. Good points. And Mark, before we go to you, Gary has, has Excellent point, line. Commissioner. Uh, thank you. There, there is no memo. You are correct. And we're just following the protocol you all created, Commissioners, where you started issues. And if you're interested in further information to make a policy decision, we schedule a policy session. So if the answer is no, mm -hmm. we're not going to go forward and, and waste your time. So okay. that's what uh, today's discussion is. We have some other is. commissioners who have comments. Commissioner Scholl. Yes, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, in uh, prior to 2016, when the bond was passed for the C-800, there's been a lot of improvements in cell phone technology and coverage in the county. Uh, for the portion of your uh, build out on the system uh, until such time that the tax base catches up to your needs, is it possible that uh, cell phone technology could <coughs> fill in for that part of the C800 radio coverage that's not yet built? Does that make sense? And the short answer is no. Uh, from the standpoint of cell coverage in that particular area is even worse than public safety radio coverage. Okay. And though you've probably heard a lot about AT&T FirstNet, which is designed for a nationwide public safety, it still isn't the day-to-day -day critical communications. Uh, uh, it does work and it is being used for some data uh, use, uh, some voice use, but it isn't designed and operating yet as critical voice data, which is uh, important to both law and fire during okay. an incident. Okay. And one other question. Yes, sir. In uh, four months from now, should you not get uh, that $2.4 million from the county in some way, what is your plan B? The plan B would be, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that we would go to a lender uh, and take out a loan, uh, and that the users, uh, the, the 19 uh, organizations, of which the county is one, mm -hmm. uh, we would go to the users and they would fund it either through uh, 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 out of cash flow, which again, they're in the same position you are, so. I don't think they're all going to, they would step up that we'd probably have to do a, a borrowing of some kind. Okay, thank you, sir. Commissioner Schrader, you're up. Yeah, it's nice to see you again, John. It's been a long time. We've worked together for years. I just wanted to clarify that one of the reasons of this cost overrun is largely because of uh, fires uh, or, or the things. Fire is right, an element okay. in it. Uh, some of the fire damage that happened at our three structures, the structures were right. built by the time uh, the fire happened, those we originally did go to FEMA. FEMA wasn't willing to cover the full cost, and this is just the structures portion, 
fortunately, uh, I guess one of the things we learned is they survived the fire. The equipment that was in them, the buildings themselves survived, and that's a good thing. That means our resiliency is good as we're moving forward. Uh, they, there was damage that some repair, about $120,000 worth, but our insurance covered that. Uh, so that piece was covered. It's what happened with the roads and the access and okay. some of those things. It, so it's a really a mix of the remoteness of these sites, some of the ground conditions of putting in the 28 miles of power, the fire, and the, the ice freeze. It was a combination of all of those issues. And costs are just going up across the board, aren't they? I mean, that's kind to, of To a certain things. degree, yes. Oh. Okay. Thank okay, you. Um, any other? Do I hear, see any, any other hands on this? Gary, um, commissioners, you can add to this. Should we bring this back for a policy session yeah. and have some of the information that commissioners need on this? Commissioners, you can submit your requests anytime. Uh, I asked some financial questions about the bond, uh, the, the payment um, on that. Um, I don't know if any FEMA or state action can give you what you need in four months. Um, I, I don't like hearing, you know, cost overruns of this nature of, of two and a half million. And commissioners have made the statements we have cost overruns on everything and everything out there. They're coming to this board thinking that we're going to save them. Quite frankly, I don't know how we're going to save everybody, and this can be a project from Jesus Christ himself, and I'm not sure how we're going to do it, okay? I appreciate I that. I do not discount the importance of the C-800 radio. That is not the issue. If we can figure out a path forward on this, I'd be more than willing to look at it, Gary. We need to consider all options. I am not willing to just pay the difference. At the very best scenario, it would be a loan until we can identify a source of funding uh, to pay off that loan. I don't even know if that's possible. I don't know if FEMA would refund us the loan or if the state. I just don't know what the legal implications are. Commissioners, do you have anything else you want to say on this? Gary. All right. Would you like us to schedule a policy session for you to make Yeah, I think we better be soon, too. I don't know. We, we have some time coming up, I think, on some dates. We'll do it in the next few weeks, yes. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for coming forward. Appreciate um, your frankness on this topic. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Next, we'll go to the consent agenda requests. For start with CECOM, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the Metropolitan Area Joint Computer Aided Dispatch System for regional tech support for 900 computer aided dispatch services. Total value is $75,000, funded through 911 agencies in Clackamas, Washington, and Columbia counties, with the Clackamas portion of $22,342 annually being paid through a combination of the 911 tax and public safety user agency funds. No county general funds are involved. Cheryl Bledsoe is the director of CECOM. Dave DeVore is Director, Interim Director of Technology Services. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I'm here with this morning with Dave DeVore to ask you to sign an intergovernmental agreement uh, to support our ability as one of four 911 centers to uh, pay Clackamas Tech Services uh, for their support of the infrastructure that supports our computer-aided dispatch system. Uh, in any 911 center, the brains of the 901 center is uh, our computer-aided dispatch. It gives all of the information, not only for us here in Clackamas County, but we are part of a four-center consortium between uh, us, uh, Lake Oswego, uh, Columbia 911, and Washington County 911. So we run a software application called the Computer Aided Dispatch uh, System, which is a central square software. Uh, and the infrastructure, the servers that it rides on, are uh, supported by Clackamas Tech Services. So this agreement just outlines the responsibilities between what my technicians and the technicians of the Magics Group do to support the software application, and what Clackamas Tech Services does for us to provide the servers, cybersecurity, and uh, the support that they give us. So essentially, us as the 4901 centers will be paying Clackamas Tech Services uh, in an agreement not to exceed 75000 for uh, essential just time and materials, the amount of hours that they put uh, towards supporting the infrastructure that supports our computer-aided uh, uh, dispatch system. So it's not general funded. We have a formula between the four of us dispatch centers that we will take the hours and we will pay them based on our formula to Clackamas Tech Services for actual <coughs> used. 
with that, we're open for any questions. Any questions or comments for the presenter? Mark? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> the 75,000, what period of time will that sustain your system? It provides us, that's what we estimate, uh, how much time we would use in the course of one year. So in One year, okay. Yep, so it would be up to 75000 a year okay. based on, and it might not be that much. It depends how many hours we actually use of their services. Any other objections? Any objections at all? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, community corrections. Approval to submit an application for a time extension and additional funding through the next Improving People's Access to Community-Based Treatment Supports Services Program, grant cycle of July 1, 2022 through June 30, 2024. The additional time and funding will allow community corrections to continue and expand the existing program. Total grant value is $823,172, funded through the State Criminal Justice Commission. No county general funds are involved. Captain Malcolm McDonald is Director of Community Corrections. Go ahead. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, this application and renewal will allow us to continue the program that we have um, that is targeted towards individuals on community supervision that have high mental health needs and um, utilize the criminal justice system at a high level. Uh, it will also allow us to expand from a 0.5 senior case manager from behavioral health to a full-time case manager that will be embedded in our office. And we're also requesting um, to add a peer mentor if the Criminal Justice Commission will allow that for that case manager. Any questions, comments, any objections? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Next, Health, Housing, and Human Services. Approval of the proposed 2022 to 2027 Assessment of Fair Housing Plan and authorization to submit to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to permit continued receipt of HUD federal grants. Total grant value is $3,452,609, funded through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. No county general funds are involved. Rod Cook is the Director of Health, Housing, and Human Services. Go ahead. Yes, uh, today we're updating you on, on, and seeking approval of the Clackamas Assessment of Fair Housing Plan prior to submitting it to HUD. Um, the summary of the plan is, is submitted in the staff report. It's pretty thick. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to take a look at that. Uh, the plan was developed by the HRS work group made up of staff from Community Development, Social Services, and Housing Authority. They reviewed data and also developed a community survey, which was distributed in three languages. 306 persons responded to the proposed goals and strategies listed in the survey. Uh, the assessment of fair housing plan goals apply to three Clackamas County divisions, Housing Authority of Clackamas County, Community Development Division, and the Social Services Division. This plan is also embedded in both the already approved Housing Authority's five-year plan, you did that a couple of weeks ago, and the five-year community development plan you just had a public hearing on last week. The public comment period on the assessment of fair housing plan was open for six weeks from February 3rd to March 2nd. No comments were received. Uh, the plan does not require a separate public hearing. Um, now that the comment period is completed, H3S is ready to submit the plan to HUD upon your approval. Any comments or questions for the presenter? Any objections? Seeing none. Thanks, Rod. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll add all these to this Thursday's business meeting agenda with your approval. Chair, is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Next, draft values on housing and shelter. Uh, we have Vahid Brown from H3S and Sue Hildick from PGA. Commissioners, this is a suggestion from your Administrator Housing Task Force. We are recommending that you consider creating a value statement on housing and shelter, similar to the transportation value statement you've already created. This is a draft. We're only seeking your input. Happy to hear whatever ideas you may have. But first, let Vahid and Sue give a quick update. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Sue Hildick. I'm Director of Public and Government Affairs. Nice to see you. In your packet today, you see a draft statement called Clackamas County Values on Housing and Shelter. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about how it came to be, and then Vahid can uh, go through the specific values it contains. Um, we think this document would be a great help both in communicating and advocating for our needs in housing and shelter at a variety of tables, particularly with policymakers and the media. Um, it's much similar to the piece we produced on transportation last year, and we've used that statement to raise the conversation to the values level, strategically position the county when we aren't ready to specifically support or oppose a proposal, and to negotiate regionally. The statement was built by looking at current documents you've already approved 
and putting together language which unites the board and makes it clear to the community our hopes and aspirations as well as our methods. Um, I want to commend Dylan Blaylock uh, for his work in reviewing past documents, interviewing our current housing leaders and composing the draft, and also Emily and Everett for their help. Um, so we think uh, we, ur we urge your approval because we think it would be a very helpful tool for us as we navigate sort of the tricky waters of housing and shelter. Fahid. Thanks. Good morning. Fahid Brown, housing, uh, Supportive Housing Services Program Manager. Um, just wanted to say I think that PGA and Dylan did a fantastic job putting this together, really distilled the values that guide our current housing work. And um, as Sue said, these do come from existing documents that have been approved by the board in previous uh, iterations, the local implementation strategy for affordable housing development, the local implementation plan for supportive housing services, the housing authorities uh, guiding values and principles for housing development. This was, this goes back to like 2016, I think, when that came to this board. Um, so existing documents that already guide and inform our activities, and when we procure for services with uh, supportive housing services dollars, when we issue an RFP, we have guiding values in our RFPs that we instruct our, our um, respondent uh, agencies to be adhering to, and so these, these are reflective of those values that we currently have. Um, the document is broken into three areas. Uh, the, um, the, the first bullets address the um, you know, permanent housing and the, the effective solutions in our housing responses and sheltering responses. The second category has to do with equity and advancing equity in our work, and the third category is about engagement and community process. Um, I'm happy to read through the values document if that would be helpful to the commissioners, but you we do have, have it. One commissioner with a comment, and yes, I would like you to read through it. I think Great. it's important. Uh, commissioner Savas. Yeah, um, Vahid, I've read through it a couple, three times here, and um, a lot of good work. I would um, respectfully ask that maybe we actually have a few additions to address a couple things, and I'll speak to that, for example. In the opening paragraph, um, or the second paragraph of the opening piece, um, um, it says, to alleviate poverty and ensure safety, health, and security for our residents. Um, so on that theme, um, what comes to mind um, that it's not, I don't think, strong enough in here that I can find is um, issues around prevention, displacement, anti-displacement, and things like that. Um, and so um, I think we got a good start, but I, I really think that we need to, to um, kind of, I won't say underscore, but at least um, have that presented in a strong way. And I do know we do a lot for prevention, right? Um, but it seems to me that it could be stronger in here or you know, exist in here. But I think the, word about, the issue about displacement, I think, is probably, as you know, you guys have heard me before, kind of beat this one to death a, long, a while back. But I think for, some, for a value statement, I think it's really essential that it be in here. Um, we need to help people before they get in the situation that they can. Um, so it, unless you cite a particular area, Fahid, in here that maybe speaks to that adequately, and do you cite, you see anything there that I'm missing? No, I think you're right. It, 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 the, the, the housing values in the top, the, the first one, the focus on making homelessness and housing instability rare, short term, and not reoccurring. I mean, I think implicit in, in the rarity goal is that we would em emphasize prevention of people entering homelessness. But I do think you're right that it, that, that could also be called out in a separate bullet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But uh, yeah, a lot of good work. Thank you. Commissioner Scholl. Yes. Fahid and Sue, good morning. Uh, on your draft, <clears throat> I, I see nothing in it regarding addressing the effects of mental health and addiction issues as they pertain to our housing and, uh, and homelessness issue. And I know that's been a, something that's been a shortcoming uh, region wide, uh, but <clears throat> it seems to me that some comment regarding how how we're going to address mental health and addiction issues uh, would be appropriate. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher. 
Yeah. I see a couple places where that's the, the issues to services is uh, addressed in here. Develop partnerships that lead residents to a path of sustainability, self-sufficiency, <coughs> housing retention, using person-centered, trauma-informed service approaches, which in my view encompasses mental health, job training, peer mentoring. I mean, I could go down the whole list that's in our plan. I would be concerned, just my view, of getting too specific because if we include certain types of strategies then that might it might be perceived as it's the exclusion of others and honestly people can go to the source of the documents for the more detailed approach like our local implementation plan or our um, plan that we also sent for the housing bond to metro which really lays it out so that's just my two cents so question oh and another comment with Commissioner Savas's question about displacement, I know that there's been talk about better integrating, but we actually do this pretty good, our development team with our housing. And it seems that this is addressing housing and shelter and not necessarily, well, it's development of affordable housing, but not necessarily what we're getting, I don't know how to really say this, Gentrification is a very, very much not just this, but it includes economic development. It includes, if we do an urban renewal district, it involves our development agency. It involves how we do development, how permitting is done, what happens when you replace housing, how we're dealing with middle housing, how are we doing with planning, how are we doing with zoning. It seems to me that that issue is beyond the scope of this. So that's my other commentary. And then my third question, when we, and I know I'm talking a lot, and then Vahid, you can correct me wherever I'm wrong, please. But I really like these values. I do know that within our Metro housing bond, I don't know what they called it. It might've been the strategic plan. It could have been what we proposed to Metro, how we were going to be implementing those bond dollars, we had specific values, and one of those is very much outlined here, which says, prioritize placing individuals and families in high opportunity neighborhoods and sites with access to resources such as transit, jobs, quality schools, commercial services, and parks. And that lens is, is huge, and it's why we have development happening in Happy Valley and dear, right near Clackamas Community College, and it's why the development at near the, the light rail line uh, off of 82nd Avenue has some um, higher end, not necessarily higher end, but between 60 and 80 or 80% 80 of AMI, and because that's a value that we put. And I don't think we necessarily need to include more mixed income as a value because it's already stated, but I'm asking that to you. Is it okay to not include the mixed income as a value here, will that will that effort still guide our work, or should we state it? I mean, <clears throat> I think you're right, uh, Commissioner Fisher, that, that 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 does come from the local implementation strategy, the document, um, and that is a kind of a broad level value. I mean, you spoke to the there's a difference between values and strategies, and so yes. this is the high level values that guide the work, and I think one of the strategies that implements that value is you know taking opportunities for mixed income development. Okay. I am good with this document as written, and I really appreciate the, the very succinct clarification to my very long-winded explanation and concern. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I just want to just highlight something here to make my point, um, Commissioner Fisher. On that fourth bullet that you just read um, is precisely what's going wrong in Portland um, as an example, and that is about displacement. Um, so if you look at where people lived where they no longer can live uh, is because of economic displacement. So to say prioritize placing individuals is saying let's keep, continue to displace people elsewhere. And I think that is the, fundamentally, I think, if you read some of the white papers that have professors have written on this particular issue, it's really about integrating people where they are into the communities where they live. That's where people, they grew up in an area, they went to high school, their friends are there, they don't want to be moved to East Multnomah County when they grew up in Southwest Portland, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
So, so that, that's why I think to balance this all out to be a little bit more thoughtful about integrating that in there. Because prioritize placing individuals, that's a strategy. Um, and again, it's values, but, but I just thought uh, on an equal par uh, or equal footing that um, something about displacement um, needs to be expressed there. Commissioner Fisher. I mean, I, I appreciate that. I don't know if the word could be prioritize integrating individuals and families in high opportunity. Maybe that's a better word. It, it is more partnership oriented and not more, more government doing this or putting people places. Or maybe another word, but I think that's, that's really good. I don't know. I also really like what Commissioner Savas is saying about displacement because he's absolutely right as to what's been happening in Portland and development and displacing people, but I don't know where that goes. Gary, would that be a, something for us to look at when we do our strategic planning about how we don't want that to happen in Clackamas County when there's redevelopment for what we have control over? So how would we make that? It's so much broader than um, our housing department. What would be the strategy for that? I would advise that would be when you are reviewing your performance Clackamas goals and how you want to shift or adjust those to accommodate what you mentioned. So, but that wouldn't be till January. That's quite a while from now. Because mm -hmm. it is really important. Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, just to that end, I just want to remind folks, we actually did use a strategy um, when we did all the redevelopment out in, um, oh, Happy Overland Island. Park. Okay, and, and what we did was revitalize the area. We did use urban renewal, if I'm not mistaken, though. Um, I, we should get that plan again. But the real piece was that we were intentional. And that, like, for instance, you know, they needed to upgrade the roads and the sewer systems, the whole area, you know, with you know, septic tanks leaking in an urban area was not a good thing. But so we set up under DTD and other organizations. So it's also broke down some silos of how people could apply to get hooked up to a sewer and it didn't break their bank so they could stay there. So it was a whole list of how you do the redevelopment and what the tools are and who were the best place where the tool landed to actually revitalize that place, get them sewers, um, help them fix up their houses, grants, loans, whatever it took. Rod, you were here when all that happened. I know Rod Cook's in the background. So uh, why don't we just pull that out and take a look at it? It really worked. And I remember multiple meetings where we said, well, we don't want to displace people there. We want to make Overland Park, you know, a park. We want to make it a good place to go. We want to make sure the infrastructure there stays. So we came up with those tools there. So if we look at blighted areas, and frankly, that's one of the biggest issues with urban renewal is because it's supposed to be for blighted areas and a lot of times we kind of squishy that and uh, <laughs> they're not exactly but this was an area that needed that kind of help to move them up so we've got a model let's just take a look and see where we can so thank you I appreciate that um, you recalling some history on this I think at this point we're going to have uh, either Vahid or, or um, read this into the record who wants to do that Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to, Chair. So Clackamas County keenly focuses on the well-being of all our families and communities. Continual investments made in affordable housing and sheltering and providing supportive services to those in need are key to keeping our communities safe, healthy, and prosperous. Lifting people out of homelessness, expanding access to affordable housing, and maximizing service impacts are critical to an overarching goal of the Board of County Commissioners, to alleviate poverty and ensure the safety health, and security of our residents. Clackamas County has identified the following values to guide housing-related programs. <laughs> Lasting and effective programs and services. Clackamas County and its service providers should focus on making homelessness and housing instability rare, short-term, and not recurring. Ensure housing options are safe, stable, and provide choice to meet the needs of each individual. Create housing opportunities across the geographic area of Clackamas County. Prioritize placing individuals and families in high opportunity neighborhoods and sites with access to resources such as transit, jobs, quality schools, commercial services, and parks. <laughs> Develop partnerships that lead residents to a path of sustainability, self-sufficiency, and housing retention using person-centered, trauma-informed service approaches. Equitable housing solutions and housing access. 
Clackamas County and its service providers should center racial equity and incorporate culturally responsive practices into service delivery, use culturally specific organizations with competencies to provide services to historically marginalized communities, ensure that staff and volunteers have the knowledge and experience to effect an increase in equity and decrease housing disparities. Increase affordable housing in areas with existing underserved diverse populations throughout Clackamas County. Robust community engagement. Clackamas County and its service providers should inform decisions and plans through inclusive and accessible public outreach strategies, solicit feedback from residents and partners across a variety of channels and methods, recognize existing barriers to public participation and take steps to remove them, especially in the case of historically marginalized communities, and ensure information is thorough, understandable, and available. Thank you. When you read it out loud, I think it really um, hits home. Um, commissioners, um, I just want to say this is a value statement. We're not directing policy here. I think that's very important to remember. We all have our preferences, for instance. Uh, Commissioner Scholl mentioned the effects of mental health and addiction. There's two words that are used in this value statement. It says health and it says safe. When you get into that, Commissioner Savas mentioned prevention and displacement. And I do think the statement that says prioritize placing individuals and families. And I think that um, just like the uh, transportation value statement, uh, we made very clear values on tolling, for instance. And I think these values are listed here, and housing is... Uh, housing and shelter is much bigger, much more faceted uh, social economic problem than I believe our transportation statement was. And I do think that staff, there's many people that worked on this document, did a really good job. I think if we start adding and adding and adding, I, I fear that we might not ever get the exact words right. Um, commissioners, what do you want to do with this? Sure, I, I, I would I would suggest um, just a change. That one change I think is really important. I just want to just try to emphasize this. We had a, a, a doctor from the federal, I, f I forgot what agency it was, come out to the Veterans Village and talk about the site, and talk about what he was impressed with, and he was impressed with um, the setting. Um, in which the Veterans Village is placed. It's not an urban setting. We have found, and I have a friend of mine that just recently retired who worked with the homeless people in the Portland metro area um, for a considerable number of years. And um, her comments were that some people choose a certain type of environment. And that, you know, and so, some people have issues with being in an urban environment that choose to live, you know, in a more of a rural kind of a setting or a quiet, more serene setting. Um, but to say that we're in a place individuals, I just, if we could just tweak that and add a displacement element to that, I could be happy. I think you've done some great work, but that's where I would prefer we go. Um, this, people, this takes choice out, and people need to be treated with, with dignity and respect. And to say that someone's hopeless, homeless, and therefore they need to be placed where we think they should be placed, I think is just fundamentally wrong. Everyone has the rights. Mm -hmm. okay. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, so I would support changing the word place to integrate. I mean, I'm actually okay with the way it's worded right now, but if that would uh, take away, like, the government having the power over the people, and we really do value choice, and I think that is integrated throughout this document. But I'm okay with that, so I'll go ahead and make a motion that we approve this document with one change on the... Well, my goodness, where did it go? One, fourth two, bullet. three, fourth bullet, yes. <laughs> to... Take out the word placing and put in the word integrating <clears throat> or integrate. <clears throat> I, that, that doesn't, well, yeah, I don't think that really covers the point, <clears throat> Commissioner Fisher. Uh, when it comes to transit, quality jobs, commercial services, some people don't choose to, to live there. Has this document taken away choice? No. That, that's my question. Has the values in this document taken away an individual's choice? prioritize no, I, or integrate placing people somewhere. Um, I know, I'm asking. You know. I mean, 
To, to my mind, Commissioner, uh, I'm sorry, Chair, no, the second bullet does to um, ensure housing options provide choice, right, is in that second bullet. But I think that the, um, the active language of placement in the fourth bullet, this is an, a, a simple change that would kind of follow the, the phrasing of the previous bullet, would be to create housing opportunities for individuals and families in high opportunity neighborhoods. So to create housing opportunities would, would, would uh, I think, change the, the active placement and, and put the agency more on the, the households who are who are, we're working with. So you would be combining bullet points three and four? Is that what you're saying, Vahid? Yeah, the fourth, well, I wouldn't combine them. I would just make the change that the the, four, the third bullet starts with creating housing opportunities. And so the <coughs> I'm, I'm proposing the fourth bullet say, create housing opportunities for individuals and families in high opportunity neighborhoods and so forth. That, that helps, yeah. you know, that helps. But what can we do for people that are want to be in that rural setting? Yeah, we're, we're creating housing opportunities across the geographic area. So I think those two bullets um, work together. They speak to that. They do. I think they do across the geographic area. Okay. Uh, okay, you want to say that again, Vahid, please? Yeah, the fourth bullet will be amended. Create housing opportunities for individuals and families in high opportunity neighborhoods and sites with access to resources such as transit, jobs, quality schools, commercial services, and parks. Yep. Chair Smith, I will withdraw my motion and make a motion that incorporates that statement just read by Fahid Brown. Do I hear a second? Second. Commissioner Fisher has made a motion to approve the Clackamas County Values and Housing Shelter document as amended and Commissioner Schrader, excuse me, Commissioner um, Savitz. Savitz has second that motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, um, Tony, please take the poll. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Schull? Aye. Commissioner Savitz? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you all for this good work. I appreciate everybody who has made a contribution to this. And before you leave, um, how will this document get out into the atmosphere, so to speak? <laughs> well, we will post it on our website. We will probably do some social media around it. Yeah. Um, thinking about a release, I think we may have done that with the transportation value statement. I think statement. we did. Yeah. And we were able to use that document multiple times when making presentations yeah. on the transportation issue, and I thought it was very helpful. <laughs> okay, well, why don't we put out a release sure. then with the state? Any commissioner can use it when you're at meetings or yep. whatever. This is what we stand for. Great. Thank okay, you. thank you. Gary, what's next? Thank you. Next, Supportive Housing Services Tri County Planning Body Update. Emily Klepper, Policy Advisor from the uh, Board's Office, will present. There is a memo in your packet. All right, good morning, commissioners and chair. <laughs> um, I'm Emily Klepper, policy advisor for county administration. Today, I'm here to talk with you about the Tri-County Planning Body. Uh, the materials are in your packet. This is part of the Supportive Housing Services Program. Uh, if you recall, there is a 5% set aside of these SHS dollars, and they are to be directed toward regionalizing the county's implementation plans. So breaking down barriers and silos, creating community opportunities um, in a regional fashion. The tri-county planning body will be instrumental, like I said, in creating a regional plan, but then also reviewing our, our programmatic strategies and financial investments. So they're gonna be doing a lot of really good, important work for us. The Tri-County Planning Body will be coordinated and supported by Metro staff. And then our county staff will be interfacing with this group kind of as a technical advisory body. So the, there'll be lots of touch points for our staff to, to meet with them. Uh, there are two actions in front of the board for your consideration today. The first is the Tri-County Planning Body Charter, um, outlining roles and responsibilities, activities, values. Um, so that is in front of you. and. We're asking for a board motion to accept this document, please. Um, the second is you also have a recommendation for a slate of candidates. Metro ran a recruitment uh, for about six weeks in January and February. We collected about 86 applicants um, who were interested in serving. The staff from the four jurisdictions reviewed the applications. We looked at um, 
who applied and looked at the expertise and other qualifications um, to to find good matches. So qualifications like culturally specific service providers, um, representatives from historically marginalized groups, uh, folks with lived experience, things like that. Um, so you have before you a list of 13 names. We feel like these are, this is a good group. I have great experience and expertise. Um, and we're also requesting, so there's 13 uh, on the slate, and we're also requesting that the chairs from each jurisdiction join this body for the first year. Um, and then that, that seat can be reevaluated after that time. So we hope that you move forward the slate. Um, Metro Council does have final recommendation, or final approval, excuse me, uh, final approval of this body. So it's two actions, approval of the charter, charter, and then a kind of a head nod for the slate of candidates. So thank you, Emily. Yeah. This document is just really well done. Again, really wonderful work from staff. I appreciate um, the three counties plus Metro coming together on this to do it. Um, so we approve the candidates from the other counties. Yes, you're, you're head nodding the whole slate a, okay. as, a, as a chunk. Any questions or comments before I entertain a motion on the charter? Yes, Chair. Yep. Um, one thing I have brought up the staff's attention is just, I just want to just state it for the record, um, and that is, and this is only because of, you know, decades of history um, when it comes to some of our regional efforts. Um, and I even heard the president of Metro even say it last evening, um, or no, actually it was one of the Metro councilors say it last evening, we don't always get our fair share. And so um, the people that are on this um, are to be appointed here essentially, um, I just wanna make a note that um, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, um, great work by the way, um, that they're not all residents of Clackamas County. The, P the Clackamas County reps are really aren't residents within the county. Correct. Okay. They they are either folks who live or work in Clackamas County. Yeah. So I think it really puts the, almost say a burden, but it certainly ought to put an emphasis on, you know, each of our, in this case, the chair for the first year at least, um, you know, the, some, I won't say a burden, but a responsibility to make sure we get our fair share. Yeah. Noted. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, I just want to thank Emily for all of her great um, work on this and in connecting, getting the history and making sure that it's integrated throughout the document. Great work. One piece I just want to put on the record that was part of the initial devising of this effort was to make sure that there was breaking down of silos and coordination and leveraging existing resources. And that is within this document, the um, it's called the Tri-County Planning Body Charter. There are opportunities to integrate, as we all know, that lack of housing is an incredibly <laughs> evident social determinant of health. So making sure that we coordinate with our health, health entities, like our coordinated care organizations, and making sure that we are leveraging existing resources and working to break down those barriers. So if it comes with the opportunities to, um, when we apply for waivers of the federal government, that we have information data and that we work constructively with our partners in the state and the federal government to really maximize our system. That's huge opportunity. And in working with Emily, looking at the Resumes of the individuals that were selected. We have vast diversity and expertise, and I think we are in good hands to see this work forward. It's a long process. It's a. Um, it's going to take a lot of effort. So thank you. Thank you, okay. Commissioner right. Savas. Yeah, I appreciate all that, Commissioner Fisher. Could you? I'm not sure I follow what you're saying. I'm a little bit. Could you give me an example, maybe how that would be realized? Sure. So within the document that is the Tri-County... Um, what, what page are you on? I'm just getting the title of it. Tri-County Planning Body Charter. There are the guiding principles that are listed, and one is to leverage existing capacity and resources. And so the opportunity for this group to look 
region-wide on how we are going to be leveraging resources that don't just belong to the Metro homeless services dollars, but belong to the region and how we build a system is, is very important. I was just trying to get an example. I'm sorry, but... Oh, well, maybe an example. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe Emily can have an example or Vahid can have an example. I have an example as the... When we talk about the um, coordinated care organizations and how they are prioritizing social determinants of health in regards to homelessness, when they did their waiver, for instance, this last time in what's called CCO 2.0, it identified housing and housing insecurity as a priority. So pulling that in and leveraging those resources to make sure that we are maximizing our efforts and addressing the problem of homelessness is important. But Vahid, please, you know way more than I do. And I mean, uh, Commissioner, that was the example that came to mind. The first one is the, um, the Medicaid waiver for, um, uh, uh, what is it, they're calling it a housing benefit. Mm -hmm. So it's a, um, a health-related services, an HRS, that with the Medicaid waiver, um, housing benefit is now a defined benefit as a health-related service. Mm -hmm. So the, I think that what an example could be, this this planning body may, and it, I think the uh, representative of HealthShare is on this slate, um, in its uh, consideration of leveraging existing resources may have a, a, a conversation as a planning body about leveraging that new resource, immense resource, Medicaid dollars, as a housing benefit that can fund the housing placement and short-term rent assistance for uh, very um, sick individuals whose um, uh, medical conditions are worsened by experiencing homelessness. But the, the CCO is a very large system, and the housing and homelessness services system is its own large system, and they aren't integrated. And so leveraging that resource through a housing navigator, which is a, a person on my, you know, in my team or who I contract with, to, to bill Medicaid for that service, that will take regional planning. I think that's an example. Yes. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further comments, I will entertain a motion to approve the Tri-County Planning Body Charter. So move. Second. Commissioner Schrader has uh, made a motion to approve the Tri-County Planning Body Charter, and Commissioner Fisher has seconded that. Any further discussion on this? Seeing none, Tony, please call the poll. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Scholl? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Now, regarding the candidates, the 13 names that have been submitted, and the chairs from each county, Gary, do we need a motion on that? Yes, please. I will entertain a motion to support the, uh, the slate of candidates that are listed on page three, Psst. along with the chairs from each county. So move. Second. Commissioner Schrader has made a motion to support the slate of candidates as presented by staff from the four jurisdictions along with the three chairs. Commissioner Fisher has seconded that. Any further discussion on the matter? See none. Tony, please call the poll. Commissioner Zavis? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Scholl? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Emily, for doing the work on this with our other uh, uh, neighboring counties. And Vahid, thank you for coming and answering questions. Thank you, Commissioners. Gary, what's next? Next, advisory board and commission appointments. Uh, Tony, would you please present? <clears throat> <clears throat> Development Agency Budget Committee currently has two openings on their commission. Through a recruitment process, one application was received. The recommendation is as follows. Blaine Skadowhi, third term. Thank you, Tony. Do I hear a motion? Move to approve the slate. Second. <laughs> Commissioner Savas has moved for approval of the Development Agency Budget Committee member and Commissioner Schrader has seconded that. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Tony, please call the poll. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Scholl? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. 
Gary, what's next? Next, review of your business meeting agenda for this Thursday, April 14, 2022 at 10 a.m. You have a presentation proc proclaiming April 10 to 16 as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. And you'll have the first public hearing to consider the proposal to form the Oak Lodge Water Authority and then the consent agenda items you approve today. Your entire meeting must end by 11 a.m. so that you may all get to your state of the county event. So it will be a short business meeting. If you have any questions on any item, please let me know and we'll happy to answer it before Thursday. Uh, next, testimony to Metro Council on I-205 toll project amendments. This is Commissioner Savas. Go ahead, please. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, I got some copies here. Just send these down. This is the draft <clears throat> uh, where I'm at today, um, pretty much with help of staff to craft uh, my testimony before the Metro Council in regard to the RTIP and MTIP amendments that... Um, we have all been discussing for a while, and Commissioner Scholl um, has, as our representative on MPAC, um, had a quite an interesting meeting. And as we did at also JPAC the month prior, JPAC meeting is um, this Thursday morning. And, um, or no, no, I'm sorry, the Metro Council um, uh, meeting is 10, 10.30 at the same time as our business meeting. So I will be missing that meeting um, and hopefully attending on time the um, the meeting uh, at our state of the county address. So I just wanted to for inform you and let you read that over if you would like um, to endorse that. That's great. If not, I'm happy to speak and use my own words as well. I mean, it's pretty much this is what I'm going to say. Um, uh, so um, your choice, if you have any anything that's jumped out to you, I know that the chair and I appreciate you giving me the latitude in the past to do or vote or say as I need to, but I think this is I always try to make sure I'm representing the commission um, in everything I do here. So um, just your thoughts on that. And, you know, don't necessarily looking for a, a vote or anything like that per se, but it is draft at the top. I might tweak a word here or there, but for the most part, the contents basically as I intend to present. So, Paul, when you do this, do you have a formal time to read this statement in, or how is that done? I'm, uh, I'm assuming, as I talk to staff, this will be under public comment at the beginning of the, the Metro meeting. The beginning, okay. Yeah. They, have a, they have like a two- or three-page agenda, so I'll, we're not even sure they'll get to this particular topic okay. on Thursday, but if they do, then at least I got my it's, – it's, it's, it's on record. You know, I think this board has given you and Commissioner Shaw wide latitude to do what you need to do, representing the values that we have on this topic. I have a question that I'm not sure what this means. Regarding the NEPA decision, it's like uh, the third to the last paragraph, uh, to, would be to build in a mid-NEPA decision point with JPAC and Metro uh, to make sure. Um, is that even possible at this point? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. I don't know what midpoint means. Yeah, well, a staff, that, that suggestion came from staff, so I presume that they think it is doable. Um, I, I don't okay. think that staff would have put it there if they didn't think so. Um, so basically the idea is really to kind of give uh, the regional body, JPAC, um, the opportunity um, after the NEPA is relatively, you know, mid through or midpoint to come back and say, okay, here's the results of the NEPA, what we have so far. And if there's any red flags, are they going to be adequately addressed? So <clears throat> I think that's, the, is that help, Chair, explain? Yeah, I, okay. that's fine. I mean, okay. you know, we're going to get what we're going to get or we're not going to get what we're not going to get. You know how that is. Uh, Commissioner Fisher. So I'm just concerned that our message is that Clackamas <coughs> County should not be told first. And... Clackamas, all three lanes of Clackamas County should not be told at once. That those two things are lost potentially with all of this. And I, quite frankly, I don't understand what all of this means. So at some point, we need to make sure that we're communicating very clearly those two points and why it's not only bad for our Clackamas County residents, but it also sets a bad precedent for the region and the state because basically what it does is it is funding a regional project disproportionately on the pocketbooks of Clackamas County residents. We have got to speak effectively and clearly on these points and I'm just concerned that that message has not been um, received by those that need to receive it. So, I mean, I'm looking to Gary. Is it possible that 
we work with PGA to have a very simple bulleted statement that says, this is why tolling all three lanes is wrong. First, it's the only place it's ever did, done in the country. It doesn't allow for choice of transportation, that there aren't other methods to travel across from one part of the county to the other, that it will disproportionately affect residents that rely on transportation for their um, frontline worker jobs. I mean, can we list it out in a way that is easily understood? So that would be tolling all three lanes in having Clackamas County be tolled first. That's a very much a concern for how we will disproportionately be affected and that we don't have alternatives. We don't have a grid system and we just need to be very clear. We got to get our region. I'm so concerned that the vote, when Commissioner Savas and Commissioner Solar and these regional tables don't support our position, we've got to make sure we are clearly identifying it. Um, and possibly we need a strategy where all of us are connecting with the, our partners on the Metro Council. We need a public relations strategy, not we need to engage in this more effectively. <clears throat> so Gary, advice, please. Uh, yeah, all the things you just mentioned, you, the board's already approved as a policy statement. We could quickly put together a one page yeah. flyer Tolling document page. that says this is the position of the Board of County Commissioners on tolling. It's things you've already said, what you just re-mentioned. We could make it, do it as quick as today and you could give it out at the Metro Council and we could distribute it widely. Okay. So. Okay, um, I'm gonna, I think Commissioner Savas wants to say something regarding that and then Mark, we'll go to you next. Yeah, so <clears throat> first of all, <clears throat> my, I, I wrote two, two versions of this and staff walked, me, walked it back quite a bit and softened it. So <clears throat> while I share your concerns, I think having our value statement accompany this as, a, as an attachment might be a good idea to, to um, reiterate all those things we have done. And I think we've done it very effectively, frankly. The fact that we have so many regional folks on board, including some of the Metro councilors who yeah. voted to support our position right alongside us, I think it's pretty significant. So I, I think we, it is being heard, uh, it is being very clear, um, and, um, but we gotta remember, this is to address the decision before them. This is not the decision about tolling in and of itself. So this is relevant to the actual technical document before Metro. This is not about the big picture. Okay. This is about the process moving forward. Right. This is about the RTIP and MTIP amendment and it's very technical nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can have both. But we can have both by having an attachment to that. Okay. Commissioner Scholl. Yeah, I, uh, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Fisher's comments on the idea that we must not ever give up on emphasizing our dislike for the idea to toll I-205 first, to toll all lanes. But I think, uh, Commissioner Savas, with your attachment to this, I think this is a good document. Okay. Any time that we can mention what was just mentioned today from uh, our commission <clears throat> about, again, I'm going to say, not tolling I-205 before any other routes in the rest of the region and not tolling all lanes. I know we sound like broken records, but we need to keep punching those items home. I think it's an opportunity. I thank my commissioners for bringing those uh, concerns up again today. So I think within mind, Commissioner uh, Savas has his uh, walking orders, so to speak. And of course, you may always bring the transportation value statement with you that we've already approved on. Any other comments on this, folks? Uh, Chair, thanks for that. And I'll just, I might make in a couple edits to reflect some of that, to strengthen sure. that a little bit. And um, now with staff hearing our discussion, um, I think I'll maybe have a little bit easier time, so. That's fine, that's fine. Okay. Go Thank ahead, you. you bet. Gary? Final item today is Commissioner Communications. Mm, okay, Commissioner Savas, you're up first. Sure, so first thing I want to mention, just as a technicality here, um, I was noticing on the agenda for today um, that it shows on the schedule on the website that there's a CCBA meeting between 3.52 and 5.52 today. Um, that needs to be corrected. Um, I yeah. don't know what that means, um, but you'll see it under April 12th under the, on the website. I believe that's a noon time yeah, thing, so I don't know what that is, but anyhow, I'll fix that. 
Uh, and Chair, um, I about a month and a half ago, I made an obligation. I have an obligation tomorrow after or tomorrow late morning, so I'll be able to attend most of the first work session, but I will not be able to attend the second part of the work session tomorrow. And of course, just to reiterate, if I do, I am able to attend the metro meeting. I will not be able to be present for the business meeting on Thursday. Okay. And um, that's really about all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Savas. Commissioner Schrader, you're up. Yeah, yesterday I participated um, with the Association of Morgan Counties. I'm on the group to rewrite, re, uh, write and take a look and modernize their bylaws. Um, part of this is because it got a little interesting uh, for <laughs> the election of the new president this last go round. So what they're trying to do is split the baby in the middle and make sure that things don't happen quite at the last minute, but that we have, I think the consensus was 48 hours uh, before we actually decide that all candidates are declared and uh, everyone gets their their paperwork in. So that was interesting. We still have more to cover on that. We will have one more meeting. And um, basically, I believe that um, it will be a new 21st century document, which I think AOC needs. I think that the director, Gina Nickel, has been doing a fantastic job uh, with that and I have every great respect for uh, President George Murdoch um, for how he's managing things in AOC and stabilizing the, the organization. Um, then, actually, I had a chance to talk to the Child Care Task Force um, consultant and uh, really had a great conversation. And it became clear to me they were doing a great job. It's all data driven, which was what my concern was that really first you have to gather the data before you make any kind of a strategy moving forward. I didn't want us to kind of jump immediately into uh, all those strategic things of funding and things of that sort before we really had the clear data of where we were going with that conversation. So um, yeah, more to come on that. Um, I've been working with Councillor Lewis on, uh, on it pretty closely. Uh, we're in alignment on a lot of things and um, I'm looking forward to having a meeting with her talking about the child care task force and where we're going with that. Um, the other thing is uh, actually tomorrow uh, with I'm a, as many of you know, I'm the liaison to water and environment services. And um, I was talking to uh, their folks there, and I would like to see if we can make a connection between Oregon State University and WES with two of the OSU programs, and that would be the Master Melatologist Program um, and actually becoming a bee uh, friendly area. Wes is interested in that. And then also they also have a master naturalist program. And because Wes is very involved in uh, water, and um, you know, clean water, good water, and a lot of restoration projects. I thought that might be a natural nexus between making those uh, making those networks happen, and seeing if we can co-host West and OSU as part of our support of our Oregon State University Extension programs and our folks at OSU to move ahead, looking to see where we can actually get some joint education programs going. So that's been. Uh, so far, so good. I've got my last NACO high performance leadership meeting on Friday. And um, I'm going to hopefully be completing the program with at least 98% of it complete <laughs> at this point. Great. But, yep. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Schrader. Commissioner Fisher, you're up. Yeah, Commissioner Schrader, I really appreciate you mentioning the Child Care Task Force work. Mm -hmm. I was able to jump on to the meeting, yeah, meeting yesterday, yeah. last night for a while, and I was so impressed with how data-driven yeah. everything is. And I think at some point we should plan, when there's a little farther along, potentially, ask mm -hmm. Chair Smith for that we can be briefed on what the, sure. the group is doing, because... When you look at the needs, I was like, I love the, the graphs. So they, and I don't yeah. have them here. I wish I did so I could refer to them specifically. But as to what the need is and what the cost is in the different age groups from infant to toddler to, to younger children to elementary age and up and the, um, the need in our county, it's very good information. And the conversations amongst the task force members 
on how to apply and yeah. integrate that information. We have some amazing minds sitting around that table. Yeah. So it was nice to listen. And, and what I was most impressed with, if I could jump in, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, thank right. you. Okay. No, with talking to Ernest, just the consultant, uh, he comes from a very strong business background. He was a CFO of a, of a corporate entity in Portland. And so um, what I like about that, too, is for me, uh, the economic development component of it, because with Commissioner Fisher, it lands in two of our committees at NACO, and you're on human services. I'm in community economic and workforce development. And what we're looking at it from the standard of enabling people to get the child care they need so they could go work and that they can, uh, you know, move up the economic ladder, um, as well as having it be um, a service that gets early childhood de development first and center, so kids from K through right three, um, three, I think is where you have the largest, you know, amount of neurons kind of developing in small children. The study shows that they kind of get that boost um, and get an enriched environment. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a really nice example of something that crosses um, to domains, if you will, which I kind of like. So anyway, thanks. Anything else, Commissioner Fisher? Commissioner Shaw, you're up. Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Last Thursday, we had a really good meeting in the C4, the Clackamas County Community Council, on homelessness and transitional shelters. There's a lot going on in the county and in H3S. They're making a lot of progress, I believe. <clears throat> the one thing I wanted to share with you is uh, the, the idea of a mental health addiction intake center with extended transitional shelter and treatment is still something that we haven't mm -hmm. really, um, we, we haven't made in the region, in my opinion, adequate progress on that. Yet our law enforcement uh, are asking for such a facility and also our own uh, H3S housing folks realize that the duration in transitional shelters would be reduced and our overall cost reduced if we had such a mental health and uh, addiction treatment center. So that's something we need to increase our activity on and our coordination with the, uh, with the region. Also, uh, next week on Thursday, I'll be going to Coos Bay for the Association of Oregon Counties, and I'd ask that any commissioners that have a topic you want me to take down there, mm -hmm. uh, please let me know. Thank you. Yeah, I might, Commissioner Shaw. We'll talk about that later. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last week, la uh, afternoon on Thursday, we had our quarterly audit oversight committee meeting, and mm -hmm. as chair, I sit on that along with Commissioner uh, Schrader, and very good information was put forth on an audit that's going to be released by one of our departments. And I always say the auditor um, is so thorough, and she does not do this to be mean-spirited or vindictive. She will see, see maybe a business process that was overlooked that we need to go back and catch. And so I always look at the suggestions coming through our auditors, an opportunity for us as a sign of improvement moving forward. Because we were, uh, did have a lot of people working at home for, what, a year and a half? And so now as we're coming back, a reminder on how we perform our business services and the protocols that we use, uh, we need to re-up our professionalism going forward on that, and it's incumbent upon all of us that we're able to follow the recommendations from staff as they are presented to us, and I always appreciate that. I always learn something on these audit committee uh, meetings, and they're just very good. Our auditors are chief auditor is uh, Jody Cochran, and then she has uh, a person who helps her, Kathy Young, and is, is, what's her title, Gary? I don't remember. Assistant Auditor, maybe that's not a good enough title. I don't know. But I want to thank them both for the information they bring. And they just think totally different than the rest of us. I can tell you right now. It's just really amazing processes. So I see no other business before the committee today. And this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>